Hello and welcome back to another Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain and alongside my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. Today we are wrapping up our three-part CME series on HER2 positive biliary tract cancer. And today diving into, which I personally think rather is the most important topic, saving the best for the last, which is managing adverse events. As because it impacts the quality of life, and sometimes, at least as physicians, we are hesitant to use some of these new meds because of not having a good grasp on the side effect and their management. To cover all this, we got Dr. Rushna Shroff back with us. Rushna, we had you recently touching on toxicity monitoring on drugs with regards to pancreatic cancer, and here we have today HER2 positive biliary tract cancer. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Rachna, welcome back. Just as a background, in our first episode, we've covered general treatment landscape around chemoimmunotherapy in frontline settings for biliary tract cancer. In that discussion, we also had a chance to talk about actionable mutations, including IDH1, FGFR alterations, and HER2, and importantly, the testing of these biomarkers and mutations. Then we build up on that. In our second episode with Dr. Punt, we touched on our available treatment options and the data around HER2 positive uh, biliary tract cancer. Today, we want to focus on the practical aspects of how to get our patients through these treatments, be it TDXD or Zanidatumab, the two approved agents, and then a few off-label options. Rachna, can we start off with trastuzumab durxtecan? What are some of the common side effects we should worry about and clinical pearls on how to manage this? Yeah, you know, I think what's the beauty of treating uh, biliary cancers now with TDXD is that thankfully a lot of uh, people, including community oncologists in particular, have some familiarity with the drug. Yes. And so mm -hmm. for those of us who had, you know, TDXD as our, our this was our first foray into it, uh, it's been a bit of a learning curve. Uh, you know, it is obviously a um, important drug in a lot of different spaces. But when we think about some of the main things that we see in terms of side effects, you know, the big concern everybody always has and, and is the, the big warning that comes with it is around interstitial lung disease. Uh, and, you know, I would say that in the world of biliary cancer, I always get a little bit nervous because some of the drugs that we use in the frontline setting for patients with biliary tract cancer also have risks, albeit, you know, small in terms of pneumonitis or interstitial lung disease as well, such as gemcitabine uh, and some of the uh, anti-PD-1s. Yeah. But, you know, the, the good news is, is when you look at the, the big data from the Destiny Pan Tumor Study, which included, you know, 41 biliary cancer patients, while there was absolutely, you know, eyes wide open for this, it was see the actual adjudicated drug-related interstitial lung disease was seen in seven patients. So 17% of patients. Uh, and the the good news, I guess I would say, is, is that the, there was a smaller number of more grade two and a much smaller number of, uh, and, of grade three and greater than when it comes to interstitial lung disease. Uh, and importantly, you know, I think, Again, because people are familiar with TDXD, people understand what to do, how, what to look for, and how to how to stop the drug and, and manage this and, and move forward with it. You know, in general, I would say that the the grade three or greater drug related uh, adverse events was close to about forty percent of patients, uh, and so that is something that I think is important to recognize and is uh, you know an important part of the management of these patients. The thing with with this drug is, is that we are able to dose reduce and there are clear stepwise dose reductions that can be brought in when we think that there are drug related adverse events that are being seen. The more common ones, things like nausea, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, anemia, those are all things that again, we all I think as uh, oncologists know how to manage, but I think there's also really clear guidance on how to dose reduce and how to mitigate some of these. Thanks for covering that, Rashna. And as you stated, at least as community oncologists, because of the bucket approval with TDXD, we have certainly had uh, more exposure to this. And why it ties into ILD, as you stated, is certainly a concern because mortality is associated with it. 
in though thankfully it's not as common though it is still important to reiterate how to manage this if one has grade one where one is asymptomatic but there is radiographic evidence of it one should stop the treatment and watch consider use of steroids and if resolution happens less than or equal to 28 days rechallenge with the same dose if resolution happens more than 28 days definitely go down one dose level from grade two and beyond certainly use steroids but do not rechallenge the patients and common side effects should not be forgotten either. That is fatigue, nausea, and alopecia. And also, as you stated, highly emetogenic as well. So one should use good anti-emetic regimens, whether that's triplet or even doublet for the, some of the patients. Okay, next up to zanidatumab. This is not antibody drug conjugate. And side effects seem a bit more manageable. Rachna, your thoughts here with common side effects and importantly, clinical pearls around this agent. Yeah. So again, like you mentioned, I mean, this is a, uh, a an ed, an antibody, monoclonal antibody, and so a little bit different. And frankly, Xanadatumab's foray into the into the world was really primarily with biliary tract cancers. And so I think we're starting to learn how to give this drug and what to expect. And when you look at the Big Horizon uh, BTCO one study, which was the phase two that led to the accelerated approval, again in patients with um, the, the 80 patients that were really looked at in the in the cohort that was of interest, which is the IHC3+, the, the general uh, treatment-related adverse events was grade three or higher relatively high, um, and, and that was around uh, 56, 57%. But importantly, uh, treatment-related adverse events that led to discontinuation of drug was really low. Uh, and again, there are dose reductions that are advised, and, and, and especially in the management of diarrhea. And that's what I would say is probably the biggest uh, side effect that we see with the use of xanadatumab. Um, any grade diarrhea was 40% of the patients. Thankfully, grade three or higher was 5%. Uh, but that was an, that's an important thing to note, as well as the infusion reactions. Um, there was a, an, an adverse event of special interest, which was concern around ejection fraction decrease. Uh, again, thankfully, that was relatively rare. Uh, and I think, again, because we were concerned for it, um, there was clear clear guidance in terms of uh, how to how to look for it and how to manage it, how to track it, how to follow it with echocardiograms, et cetera. Um, and again, grade three or higher in terms of ejection fraction decrease was like a little bit less than 4%. So it's really that diarrhea. And I would say in the day-to-day -day practice, you know, we, we say all the time that even grade two diarrhea is a big deal for patients. And so there was some suggestions made uh, partway through the study in terms of prophylactic, if you will, or, or aggressive anti-diarrhea management and um, introducing that, I think, really seems to help mitigate some of that. The people that had dose reductions on this study, it was actually primarily diarrhea that led to those dose reductions uh, in the grade three patients. And so I think as much as we can do to prevent that from getting to the point of severity, such as grade three, is really important. You know, a few things from patient perspective, when we're talking about these side effects, what do they really feel day in, day out? So diarrhea, be it grade two, is problematic. Going back to TDXD, that alopecia, that fatigue, that nausea is problematic. That asymptomatic ILD is something that patient's not going to pick up on. That's on us. But these things that they day in, day out feel for us to keep them going, saying, hey, our goal here is palliative intent. So let's keep you on these medications. On our end, we need to do better and better in addressing these things. And Rachna, you also touched on the idea of echo. Any single time we're using any anti-HER2 agents, be it Zanidatumab, TDXD, even these off-label options, right? Trastuzumab, Pertuzumab, we have to be mindful. Thankfully, in Horizon BTC01, the degree of what we saw ejection fraction reduce was small but we still have to keep up with this. Rochna, there are other drugs such as trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TKIs that can potentially be used that, that are off-label. But given we have TDXD and zanidatumab that's approved now, is there any patient where you would consider using these other anti-HER2 agents off-label outside clinical trials? You know, I think I would be hard-pressed to do that. Again, like you said, the safety profile is important to recognize, but I, I think we we know it. We know what to look for. It. We know how to manage it based on you know again, preventative medications, prophylactic medications, and or dose reductions. And so I think I would be hard pressed outside of a clinical trial to try some of these other drugs at this point. Now that being said, just like the FGFR inhibitor space, I think the big obvious question is is if we have all of these different 
drugs available to us? How can we sequence through it? And frankly, to the point about, you know, anti-HER2 therapy and things like ejection fraction, you know, is cumulative toxicities as you cycle through these different agents, is that something that, you know, what happens there? How can we, again, prevent and or mitigate that sort of thing? And, you know, regular monitoring, for instance, of ejection fraction is an obvious one, but I think even some things that, like I mentioned with pre prior gemcitabine and, and PD-1, you know, with the in interstitial lung disease, and then thinking through how to keep those patients well enough to make sure that they could potentially have other anti-HER2 options. Um, and so I think that's going to be an important question is, is as we pile on the anti-HER2 therapies, you know, what toxicities become really, you know, dose limiting, not in the, in the protocol word of, of it, but like you mentioned, just quality of life for these patients. Certainly, the space is getting crowded and patient shared decision making is always the key here. Raul, you were bringing the topic of echocardiogram retina. Uh, how often are you getting it? Just like trastuzumab, would you be doing it every three months? Of course, one at baseline and beyond that every three months? Yeah, that is absolutely what I do. And again, you know, I think it was really um, uh, a, a bit a bit of a relief because like I said, Sanadatamab, there was a real concern around it. So right. it was a relief to see that it was not as big of a problem. Right. But like you mentioned, I, I don't think that that should make us okay. relax in terms yep. of how we, how we follow this and monitor for it. Yeah. And again, mm -hmm. I think it was like less than 5% of the patients that had grade three or more ejection fraction reduction with Sanadatamab. Now, given the options that we have here are TDXD and Zanidatumab, uh, for TDXD, 5.4 mg per keg is the starting dose, whereas for gastric cancer, we've seen some utilize 6.4 mg per keg, but there are more side effects related with the higher dose. Uh, and these side effects, again, ILD and marrow suppression are more dose dependent, but we have good options of going down in terms of the treatment uh, dosing here, 4.4 mg per keg, and then even 3.2 mg per keg. What about zanidatumab? Starting dose is rather 20 mg per keg every two weeks. Side effects that we've touched on, diarrhea is certainly a concern. If one encounters that, how do you go about step-down dosing here? Yeah, so, you know, again, the way that the, the study was designed, the plan was uh, for for dose level minus one to be 15 mg per kg. Um, I will say when you look at actually the data in terms of the few patients that did require dose reductions, uh, the majority of the patients only had to go down dose level minus one. So, you know, I think that may be that sweet spot in terms of, of being able to, to improve some of the main side effects, again, diarrhea being the main one that drove dose reductions. Uh, and so hopefully that 15 mg per kg is, is that is is the ideal one for patients that experience some of those side effects. And Rachel, can you also touch a little on the infusion-related reactions with zanidatumab? Not common, but what we've seen is you start this off for a longer duration, and as you continue to get exposed, you can give this medication quicker and quicker. Something from your experience in terms of infusion-related reactions around zanidatumab? Yeah, you know, like you said, grade three, four infusion related reactions rare, but about a third of patients had some form of infusion related reaction. And, and actually, you know, I, I had patients on this trial, and, and I had a patient who experienced it. And, you know, I think from, again, when you think about it from a patient facing perspective, it's actually a really scary thing that happens to them. Um, you know, m my patient felt like she was like, Oh, my God, I feel like I'm dying. I mean, you know, and it wasn't, I mean, there was nothing um, vital sign based that made you think that way, but it was, it was from a patient experience perspective, she was very scared to continue, um, on the drug. But like you mentioned, you know, I think again, there's pre preemptive and pre preventative medicines that can be done to mitigate some of that. Thankfully, it was not something that was as common as they thought it would be. And, or, you know, grade three, four, as severe as we thought it would be. Uh, but by and large things that we typically do when we Think about infusion-related reactions in the world of GI cancers, because you know we have a fair amount of familiarity with this between oxaliplatin, cetuximab, et cetera. You know we are able to to do those same things with preventative medications, slowing infusion times, et cetera, without having to really stop the drug. And again, I think the big part here is setting that expectation and educating your patients in GI world. Like you mentioned, we have few drugs out in community. We're seeing more and more of these newer class of of drug that we have to be mindful about. And thankfully here again, the grade was rather low. So as we wrap up here, a few things to keep in mind, the importance of biomarker and NGS testing in biliary tract cancer. If you find actionable mutations or biomarkers, making sure that these patients get exposed to these active agents. 
And then of course, managing side effects that come along with these agents so that our patients can stay on these medications longer, especially when the treatment here is with palliative intent in metastatic settings. Rachna, thank you so much for touching on this critical topic of adverse events and how to manage these toxicities. For our listeners, make sure to check out our other episodes in this series with Dr. Abu Alpha and Dr. Shubham Pant. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.